Hi there, I'm Chris from Air Windows, and uh, I'm on a couple of minutes late. That's because my uh, Blackmagic Thunderbolt software refused to work momentarily, and I had to juggle it around and try to make it work. It's going to be a weird day. Got a lot of interesting things going on. I am uh, rebooting a lot of technical work. I don't even know who is here because I haven't had time to get anything straight in my head as far as how this is working, but that doesn't matter. All that matters is I will get this together and we will have my live chat. And I'm also rebuilding my uh, modular thing because I've learned some new ways of using it that I'm going to try to put in a place. Let's see, I guess I do have audio. That's nice. And... We'll get chat up, and we've got Bo in the chat. So hey, I don't think there's everyone, there's just like three people. I was not uh, timely in terms of showing up today, but then neither is anybody else, so whatever. On that note, I was also going to bring a, um, oh, I was also going to juggle with this too. I did not remember to do this for the uh, post plugin thing. So Darwin has a question. Absolutely, I'm ready. I am ready enough for you. Um, if Studio Tan is only manipulating, well, it doesn't. It would be just perceptually through a psych psychoacoustic effect. All Studio 10 is doing is dither much like any of the other dithers. Um, you're going to get, in upcoming weeks, especially when I get all this stuff sorted out, you're going to get a version of both um, raw glitters and raw timbers, which includes what's in Studio 10. Um, that has the de-res thing, and you'll be able to hear what it's doing in a more aggressive way then. I don't think it's a replacement for loud. I think loud is actually better. I wonder if I can move this to where I can see my damn metering. Signs point to yes. I'm hiding it underneath the chat. <laughs> I have this microphone here. It's this microphone. Kind of a, a crazy old monster. But it's an old studio project. And I can have it right in front of me and hide it underneath chat. So that way, if I make chat disappear, you can see a bit of the microphone there. Oh, the YouTube -y thing. It's all, it's all funny the way that works. You're constantly trying stuff and editing things. Like, I don't have the brighter lighting, but I feel like this is more of a low-key day for me anywho. Um, I got a lot going on. I got a lot of reconfiguring. I got a lot of plugins to do. And I've been doing a lot of theory stuff, some of which I might be able to bring up in, um, you know, talking about it on the stream. So, was Bequaza sounds like somebody from the Colin Bender's crew. Waza, um, why the prime numbers choice? I'll tell you, the prime numbers choice. And there's any number of ways to do this. I've actually found lists of super primes, which are primes that are spaced out in a certain way. Like if you have primes that are only two apart, you space them a little bit more. But if you use prime numbers for delay taps, then the comb filtering effects will never totally cancel out or reinforce anything. That's the way prime numbers work, is you'll wind up getting an almost an all past like effect where there is not a big amplitude difference in frequencies. It's not going to emphasize anything or cancel anything too hard. And that's relevant particularly in the really high frequencies 
So that's why the prime numbers choice. Prime numbers do that. Now, the difference between dark and dithermy timbers is dithermy timbers uses just three samples, and it's comparing the sample between adjacent samples. Yeah, so you get no resonant peaks, exactly. I hope that this machine is behaving itself because as I'm gesturing and stuff, I hear the autofocus going berserk over there. The, the camera that I use is known for having a crappy autofocus, so usually I've just not used one, but this particular lens does actually have one available. So I'm seeing whether that is usable or not. Maybe I just move around too much for that. But um, Dithermy Timbers is using three adjacent samples at whatever sample rate you're running. So it's more audible down at 44.1K. Dark is running a big collection of samples. Like, uh, I think as many as 30, 30, 40, something like that. And it is extrapolating from those samples and coming up with a sort of smooth trajectory. It's basically doing a super low pass filter and trying to, oh, I can't do the tempo plugin, Bo. I don't know how to use those, but I got your information and I was able to open the uh, spreadsheet. Bo is helping me out with the uh, tempo stuff that I've been doing where um, I found sort of nodes different moods at different tempos, and they seem to be repeating in this algorithm. By the way, if I need to jump up at some point, guys, it's because I have a uh, some computer stuff coming in. Namely, today should be the day that I get the computer that could run VCV rack and stream at the same time. And if I get that, I can do streams for showing people how to use modular synths, which are, of course, a big, you know, that's something that I really like. And I'm not so much into VCV, but people can get VCV. And uh, I can show you how to use modular stuff because that's something that I'm really into. Um, Beam also does use a window of samples as well. What Beam is doing is it's doing the window of samples, and rather than trying to hit whatever angle it is that would equate to a uh, low pass, like an extremely aggressive low pass, is, and, and you know, 30 samples is not all that much. It's not going to be like, this is only going to emphasize subsonic sounds. Instead, it's just doing a sort of slope where dark, because it's going to try to average out the dither behavior on the end of the chain of samples that it's got. Remember, it includes the sample that I just arrived at. It's doing a list of all of the resulting samples it's produced, not the input samples, but the um, quantized samples that it's produced. So it's always gonna calculate of these which of these is going to make the quietest end result in high frequencies? How do we average these out in such a way that the next one that I choose is going to be the smoothest possible effect? Now what Beam does is, Beam does the same calculation, but it's going, which one that I choose, like rounding up or rounding down, is going to be the closest to this angle up or this angle down? which is probably always going to be the same one for, I, I think Beam is not going to end up being the winner as far as ultimate air windows behavior and replacing things. But uh, it is an interesting, it, it does a thing that I don't think anything else does. <laughs> there's, there's nothing that does what Beam does, whether that's useful is a whole other story. And yeah, since it's emphasizing these frequencies, or not even frequencies, it's emphasizing slope angles in the waveform, which has nothing to do with frequencies. And it's not something that we usually can do anything about. Um, 
as as far as other plugins to magnify that in other ways, it's certainly something that might be interesting to do. I'm not quite sure how I'd do it, but we've already got plugins that um, distort or change the uh, the angle and things. It's like if there was a plugin that could do a density like behavior, a soft clip but towards these slope angles rather than just it. This is the kind of thing where, first of all, people are like, why are you even thinking of that? And secondly, what good could it possibly do? We care about frequencies. We care about frequencies and amplitudes. The slope angle is meaningless and has, well, that's, that's the thing is because nobody has any concept of working with this kind of stuff directly, it's almost irresistible. Like I've just got to figure something out along those lines. But you know, these things take time. It was really interesting putting out Bright Ambience because Bright Ambience is from a long way back. It is a much older plugin. It's like a early attempt at um, reverb using these prime number thing. It was supposed to be the ultimate reverb, but it's absolutely not, but it's a really interesting effect. There's a comparable, there was a company, I don't remember who they are, and and by the way, when I was talking about like, oh, millennials listening to Close to the Edge for the first time, uh, I, I misspoke, I'm old, and Generation X and have a hard time noticing that there's anything newer than millennials happening. No, it's Gen Zers watching Close to the Edge for the first time, and it's wonderful. There's this little, it's this little YouTube channel, like Andy and something or other, and it's these two college kids, like college students react, and they're doing apparently super well on Patreon. I'm probably going to join them myself so I can see some. They, they did a patron only of their reaction to 21st century schizoid man, that's got to be worth the price of admission alone. I, I've got to see that, so I'm probably going to be throwing them a buck. But um, it's it's kind of like the Wings of Pegasus guy who does React videos, and he's a guitar player. He's considerably older. He's like probably maybe millennial, maybe a little older than that. But um, he has this thing where he's basically analyzing... YouTube videos, and he does tons of that. And what I liked about him, although I didn't really stick with him, is just the positivity, like how he just had this really good attitude about everything. And these Gen Z kids, the, the college student reacts kids, man, it's delightful because as they keep listening to more and more challenging music, because people like throwing stuff at them that's going to blow their little minds, and as they keep listening to stuff, they're developing this really interesting musical intelligence. They're like learning things about production and arrangement and music. And you can see like the light bulbs going off everywhere. And they have wonderful taste. I absolutely love it. Like uh, it's all very well being super impressed by, I don't know, Dream Theater or something. And I like Dream Theater. But then if you can't also just freak out over Born on the Bayou by Creedence Clearwater Revival. There's something wrong with you. And these kids watch Born on the Bayou. They're from, they're apparently from uh, uh, Florida. They're like Florida hippies or something. Florida music kids. And they love Born on the Bayou so much. And I am complete, I absolutely agree completely with them. So, so yeah, that's been fun. That's been taking up time that I should spend working watching these, these uh, a, a newer generation, a much newer generation, um, absolutely loving the kind of music that kept me alive for many years. In really difficult times, I needed something to cling to. And it was stuff like Close to the Edge. And, and I had all, it's like, they're me. I had all the same reactions. And that became my uh, lifeline for you know, sticking around in the world was, well, but there's this in the world, and I can listen to this music again because I have this record. And that's that's really important. There, there's very difficult times currently. And honestly, my, my, my take on 
uh, current events and stuff, it's like, well, I've seen worse, but that's typical Generation X for you. <laughs> We've seen worse. Nobody really asks us, so it's like, whatever. But um, I like the idea of people finding joy in things, and I like the idea of, um, you know, those lifelines, finding stuff that's amazing. Like, my ambition, my current ambition now is I need to start, I need to make more songs like the one that I did, get better at it, because I clearly need to get better at it, and start singing on them as well, and do some stuff that, like, these Gen Z kids would like. Because I can see them liking all the same things that I absolutely love. And it's like, wow, it doesn't die. This comes back around. This is just part of the human condition that we can just light up over some of these things. So yeah, to respond to further live chat, because I see more stuff popping up. Um, uh, Beam is literally... Quite, oh, I, I also missed how to use Star Child creatively. Well, the thing about it's like Star Child is a really specific little plugin. It is doing um, a very particular repeated delay kind of thing. It's weirdly like Bright Ambience, only in a coarser level and more controllable. Bright Ambience is this dense cloud. Uh, uh, my autofocus is going so bonkers. I moved to him. I'm partly Italian. I'm not partly Italian, but I'm talking with my hands all the time, and the poor autofocus is like, ah, ah. So, um, Star Child is kind of like Bright Ambience in that um, it's more coarsely spaced, but it has this densely packed block of echoes that can be. If I'm remembering Star Child correctly, because it's been a little while since um, I did that one. But it's designed to be sort of like that, sort of like this burst of delays, which then cut out, or maybe feed back the end result of the burst of delays into itself again. So what ends up happening is you don't use that as a regular delay because the spacing of it, I distinctly remember one of the things about Star Child is it's not just a perfectly even set of delays. There's a little irregularity in there. So what you do is you don't use it like a straight up echo. You don't use it in a rhythmic sense, you use it in a textural sense. And that's because there's a little bit of chaoticness to the distribution of the delay tabs. I might have this totally wrong. Anybody can correct me if I've got it backwards or something. So that's basically it. You'd use it like it was a reverb rather than using it like it was a slapback. I don't think it's capable of doing a um, echo style behavior but it is capable of filling in space in a distinct way. And Beam, I would not be at all surprised if Beam jumps between two or three levels of personality and behavior relative to the average level of the sound. Beam is a strange beast. It's not doing anything normal. So observe, observe away. Maybe you can tell me things about what it's doing that I don't even know. Um, as far as BPMs, I have not checked into how many songs are in 117 or 118, respectively. Although I found various, like if you search, you can find various databases which are not necessarily accurate that give you some of this kinds of information because the thing about it is that people throw numbers into databases like that willy-nilly and they don't necessarily have them right and sometimes the songs wander or they're not in a steady tempo or they have multiple parts and you just assume that they mean the part that you remember and the the granularity of like 117 versus 118 bear in mind that i think the key zones here are the uh, stable zone and the unstable zone. 
I can go and grab my most recent version. Autofocus, take me away. I'll peel this off of here, which is here so that I can refer to it, so that I can then do the new version to replace it. So yeah, now I've got a thing where the camera will actually focus on what this is, presumably. Maybe it's not. Anyway. So I have got a new uh, thing made up, which I'm going to have to update it yet again, because this is me and Bo's first try at a example. hope you can see it properly. Um, this is me and Bo's first try, because I started with this concept. And then Bo came up with a, uh, Bo here, who's posting in chat, came up with a notion of doing the, an algorithm based on pi, because he was like, this is very close to pi. And then he was like, well, this is um, very close to 1 over 60, in other words, beats per minute um, by the second, and started throwing these things into the equations. And I was like, right on, this is exactly how I like doing things. And we're zeroing in on a algorithm which really does this. But the things in blue are the things that are most stable feeling. The things in red are the ones that feel most unstable. Like there's a lot of energy and craziness going on there. Anything picked at those tempos are going to feel kind of more intense rather than the very serene and chill and feeling very stable and in control. The green and the purple, the green is the groove section, like the 117, 118, and the purple is the swagger section, which is like walk this way or whatever. And the thing to know about those is these are not magic specific numbers. These are just um, what I consider to be the center of those nodes. So if you were going for absolute optimum smoothness, you'd go for something like 113 or 130 or whatever. But getting it slightly wrong isn't necessarily going to break that behavior. Instead, if you go from 113 to 114, you've just leaned a little bit over in the direction of the unstable, which gets you close to that groove area where there's a bunch of energy pouring out. So if you pick 114, it's just a little bit more energy than the the purest stream of smooth flowing. And if you pull it back to, you know, like 112, 110, you're getting closer to the 109, which is the swagger value that is like there's a little hesitation and a little more attitude to it. So it's not like there's there's no wrong tempos. It's the idea of there's these particular zones, the smooth and uh, stable zone, and the maximally unstable zone. And even those are somewhat subjective. It's just that I feel that the, the lists of hit songs that I've put up demonstrate that these are moods, you know, like, like they say, this is a mood. <laughs> and so if you get the 117, 118 groove uh, region, you might find that the ones that sit into 117 are essentially um, a little bit more chill, and the ones that are in 118 are a little bit more fiery, a little bit more bouncy, a little bit more energy, because that's basically how the tempo thing works. If you pull it back, and it gets weird if you've got something like the 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 swagger section is strange that way, because the groove section is dead obvious. It's like a little bit more energy, you go to the more energy and more unstable zone, less tempo, and you go to the less energy and more stable zone, so that the groove section is dead simple to work around. You can, I, I found several sites, a bunch of different databases. I haven't linked to them. None of them are particularly special. You can find like exercise songs, 
like look up tempo databases for songs to exercise to and you'll often find lots of different stuff like that. And then the weird thing about the swagger ones is that if you slow them down, they become more explosive and high energy. And then the swagger stuff, if you speed them up, they become smoother. So that's that's weird and interesting. But uh, yeah, I'm in the middle of working on this. And another thing came up that I'm also working on. And by the way, it's doing my head in that I can't actually see it. Like it's, it's good that I can't see my camera feed, but I keep hearing the autofocus going off. And I'm like, what are you doing to my image? And I can't, I also can't see my level meter, so I can't tell whether I'm blowing the hell out of the YouTube, I hope not, with the microphone. Like I have a comfortable setup now that I'm not chained with a bunch of different wires and things, but I'm still getting used to using the higher quality condenser mic, and uh, we will see how all of this develops. It is a work in progress, and if I learn things, I can teach these things to others, so it's all good. The other thing I'm working on theory-wise is another concept. And I'm wondering whether I can move my crap out of the way and get my information up somewhere. Here's what I got so far. I may be able to bring this onto screen if I'm very clever. Let's see if we can't do this. I called this one Lyricist Cheat. Check this out. Meep. So you can't see me. I'll get this out of the way. Um, up at the top here, I also can't see chat, so let me fix that. Um, cool beans. Okay, so that's cool. Um, yeah, I might end up doing something like that. Um, we shall see. Um, so here is the lyricist thing I'm talking about. And what you've got here is a list of words from the uh, XKCD Upgoer 5 text editor. Because XKCD did a thing where uh, Randall Monroe was like, let's do things using the top thousand words in English. What can you express using only the top thousand words? And he did an entire book about this, explaining all kinds of stuff. And he also ended up having to call it the top 1000 because the word thousand is not in the words. And I can probably fool around with this window, juggling with windows as one does. I'd like to still be able to see chat in case somebody says something. But yeah, so this first line here in the text editor is the remains of what I started with, where I took the list of the top thousand words in English as XKCD had them. And these are what are in the Upgoer 5 text editor. And Upgoer 5 is a project that he did where he was explaining scientific concepts using only the top 1,000 words in the English language. So the Saturn V rocket, he did an entire page in this book that he did illustrating this rocket, but since Saturn is not in the words, he had to call it something within the words. So he called the Saturn V rocket the Upgoer 5 and explained everything about how it works in these extremely cumbersome ways that use only these very, very simple words. Like, you know, explain like I'm five kind of words. And it struck me that that would make an interesting way to write lyrics. Because if you can write lyrics with only those words, they're probably going to be really damn approachable and people will be able to understand what they say. 
And I bet there's a lot of lyrics already that stick to this dictionary. So what I did was I first downloaded it and I sorted the, the words were already sorted, but I made it into one big paragraph, which is kind of like what you see at the top. And I have been going through and doing a rhyming dictionary out of this, but not just a rhyming dictionary, a cheap ass sort of cheaty rhyming dictionary. And we're having some difficulty seeing all of this, so let me resize this some more. There we go. I'm going to have to keep moving this. There, just a moment. There we go. So I started with this, and I've been going through and trying to break them down into rhyming words. Like you'd write a lyric, and the uh, up go or five words you could use that rhyme are annoy, avoid, boy, enjoy, join, noise, point, voice. But I'm also doing something else with them, which might be even more useful. And that is some theorizing that I'm doing on the basis of how words are singable. Like if you write a, uh, a song and the vocals you're using are essentially in the middle here, like ah, like brought, and you were moving to a different vowel sound. These move in directions in the throat. Like ah is a pretty much open throat, open vowel sound. And as you change these, you have to go through yeah to e. Uh, yeah. And you have to go through O oh to get to OO. Uh, uh. So it's this continuum. And if you can write lyrics that move in consistent ways through these, I think that will make them be more singable. So I'm experimenting with this now. So I'm basically making this crude ass rhyming dictionary that includes a lot of cheatiness, like stuff that would be a really cheap rhyme, but it sits in the same vowel sound. And I'm just continually going through and, and focusing on like the, the, the sing, the sung note rather than tail end uh, echoes. And I feel that there's something to be gained by this. At least I hope so. I'm working on it. But there's also a side thing, which is that if you're doing choruses, if you're doing stuff that needs to be sung and it has to be loud, then you're going to be focusing on the um, ah to ea, yeah, but going to e is not, strangely, it's not as screamable. Depends. Like, some of those ones under E, like, believe is clearly an E, but something like, uh, and then I have a whole list of uh, adverbs, because there's an entire adverb section. But, Something like, what was I trying to find? I saw something in there. I tote saw something in there. Like, drive is not really an E, but it ends on an E. It goes up. Drive. Hide. Hide. And the thing about those words, which are a little bit lower on the list, is that you can sing them and leave the E off. You go drive, and you don't go, you don't go drive. And the cheatiness of this stuff, it's, it's the key thing with singing, singing uh, lyrics, is that you don't necessarily have to pronounce everything the way the word is. 
you can totally fake it if it's more singable. And that stuff interests me greatly. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm necessarily good at it, but it might make it seem as if I'm much better at it if I start writing along these lines. So I'm always looking for a good way to cheat. Uh, I'm losing the ability to read chat. I'll, I'll just move it so that it's farther. So, so anyway, this that I will take off of the screen now is what I'm also working on, and that is taking many hours for me. But I'm going to be trying to go through all of these and finding ways to sit them in the rhyming dictionary in such a way that um, the cheaty quality of it is maximized. Like here, we've got um, rhymes in the ah category, like brought, cross, father, and father, water, don't necessarily have that same thing, but if you sat on that vowel sound, you could cheat and be like, yeah, cross rhymes with father. Got a problem with that? And if you could sing it in such a way that people wouldn't really blink, they wouldn't really cringe at that so much unless they were being picky and be, that's not really a rhyme, but you know, we don't care. So let's... Hide that and make that go away. I'm going to be going for like, a, what is it, an hour 45, something like that. I have this thing, I just haven't put it back up yet again. My little Patreon measurement does have us at an hour 45. So that means I'm going to go till like 12.45, I guess. Let's see if it ever focuses on me. Hi, camera. I'm here. There we are. Yeah, and i got to move my other crap around. And move chat so I can actually read it. Yeah, so tempo analysis. Yeah, that'd be that'd be interesting. It's very possible that ACDC were doing useful things regarding regarding that. And by which I mean tempos where it's like, okay, now we get more swaggering at this part of the song and they're actually choosing something that aligns with these observations. <laughs> So yeah, that's where we're at so far. If I need to, I can get up and get my paper and uh, brush pen for illustrating things. I don't know, but I think that basically it's time to ask for more Q&A and see how things look that way because, well, because I've been working on all of this stuff so hard and I started getting to not just another dither with the D-Res thing and that did not work for me yesterday so I had to throw in bright ambience at the last minute just to have something to post because not just another dither was not functioning properly when I ran it. I needed to make it so that I could bring them, bo bring that and the one in monitoring up, and cut them in and out in my test rig, and have there be literally no change. And I wasn't getting that. Uh, my my recoding of the uh, not just another dither plugin was failing pretty hard to do the same thing that it does in monitoring. So I had to do a lot of debugging, and by the time I had finished doing that, it was the middle of the night and I didn't have a VST one ready. So I'm going to have one of those for next week. And I've got a bunch of these um, dither plugins coming next week. So I wonder whether I'm hearing a 
package being delivered? Probably not. So yeah, and now I can't see my dum uh, dum. Don't mind me, the chaos is much with me today. So yeah, this is one of those times when I believe I can still keep my stuff going with the exception of I haven't done music for a month. And that's partly because it's not in a working condition and partly because I've just been kind of burnt out on stuff. It's coming back when it's ready to come back. I do feel that, you know, People don't really care about that very much. And part of that is because they haven't got it to be good enough yet. But also part of it is because, you know, well, technically you can download that stuff, but it's not a plugin. And people like plugins. People like stuff that they can use. And people also seem to like these theory things when they can join in, which you can totally do. Like my initial concept of the tempos thing, this, that I was working on, um, Bo sort of took that and ran with it and started throwing out alternate uh, formulations, which I liked better. So it's sort of like the community is evolving this. When I end up posting it, I will post it on Air Windows, and I will post it on the Patreon, but I don't hide anything on the Patreon anymore. That's the change. For a while there, I was doing the thing where it's like, I'd better have some stuff on Patreon that is um, patron only. And then I learned that they'll start charging you sales tax. So it's like, nope, nope, not going there. Instead, what's gonna happen is everything that was formerly, and we're talking basically the evergreen stuff, that is all now publicly available off of the patron Patreon to anybody who visits it. And that means that I can say with great convincingness uh, you don't have to charge any of my patron sales tax. All of them are getting basically just straight up donation rates where you're not charging sales tax for sales of goods. Because I care a great deal about not having people get charged um, extra stuff beyond what I told them they would pay. I have a problem with the system, and there was a while in, what was it, 2018 or something, like November of 18 or 19 or whatever, where Patreon was suddenly charging a surcharge on top of everything, and I scrambled and changed all of my tiers to incorporate that uh, number so that it was up front, and then they stopped and changed doing that. Chad is getting into some of these talks about uh, Midnight Rambler and such. I don't know if the tempo of this, the breakdown of Midnight Rambler is a subdivision of the higher tempo of the rest of the song. I mean, one of the things that the stone is dead that comes from blues is the tempo is very organic. Like they will pump up more if needed or dial it back. And indeed, they did not use very speed. They're just running the band faster and slower. And that's, you know, decelerando, accelerando. There's, there's classical music terms for these things too. But it comes out of the blues. It comes out of live performance, you know, as a band. And I am not sure whether the tempos they arrived at were any form of subdivision of the other uh, tempos they used. And it'd be kind of neat and weird if it was. I'm not sure. Oh, somebody's on my porch. Give me a moment. Yeah.
Nice. Fellow says, have a good day. Damn straight I will. That's the computer that could run uh, VCV Rack and stream at the same time. I ain't setting it up right now, but I know what I'm doing with the rest of the day. So yeah, um, we can. I, I showed you guys the lyric thing, but maybe that's not interesting anybody who's following the chat, because it's one of those things where it's like all of a sudden I'm talking about pigments or something, and uh, you're not necessarily down with that. I'm not sure if my folks on the stream are lyricists per se, or even vocalists for that matter. But um, I do end up continuing to get into these things. Like I've spent a lot of time studying stuff like pigments and watercolors and uh, visual arts. And I get the opportunity to experiment with these things, hopefully to the benefit of others and to myself. It depends. It depends upon how well stuff like that comes off. But um, I do know the temple stuff struck people. Hey, John. So beyond that, I got about another hour of streaming that I have promised to do, which is not to say that I couldn't be like, OK, guys, screw you all. I'm going to go and install the new computer now. I'm not going to do that, tempting though it might be. But um, at this stage, and I started off with um, stripping out some of the stuff in my modular. I've been I've been building it all up so that it has the capacity to um, do my music a little bit better, and then stripping it all right back down again when it's not right and reconfiguring it all the time because I've ended up with enough bits that it's doing the things that I want but that's a that's a moving target all the time so between that being all taken apart the new computer and stuff um, I'm super distracted so you're gonna have to ask questions I believe I will be able to answer questions but um, as far as me making a cohesive narrative of where my work is at the moment is going at the moment, I don't feel I'm going to be capable of doing that right now. So yeah, the most recent questions in chat are, did you get a new Mac and Chris got a new machine? Hell yeah. Yes, it did. And with a bit of luck, I'll be able to expand what the streaming and stuff does on the back of that specifically involving being able to stream stuff like VCV or whatever, being able to stream stuff that's also pretty taxing to the machine, like being able to stream, for instance, working in Logic. And I demo plugins and things in Logic, but it's not quite the same as trying to track to it, because if I was capturing a bunch of tracks at the same time, I I'm not sure that I would have been able to do that. Instead, I'm doing simple playback. There's a, there's a lot of possibilities. So yeah, and I know that VCV Rack is definitely CPU intensive because I have had a, uh, although I didn't know that an, e and, and an eGPU will help that. Interesting. But, um, yeah. Mega list of idioms ripe for the tweaking. <laughs> I don't know, man. You got to get that through cultural understanding. I don't think you can do a rhyming dictionary of idioms. Eddie, hey. Oh, that's another thing. The um, My Minecraft streaming on Wednesday should be easier because the, with the the replacement Mac, Part of the purpose of that is so that I can do like all the different streaming, including like what I'm on now, I can do this live streaming, but I wouldn't be able to like play a Minecraft game of Minecraft and stream that and have it be the same 
frame rate as streaming the Minecraft on an entirely other computer that can do acceptable frame rates and then streaming it out a HDMI cable and capturing that like it was a camera. So I've been having to do things in this insanely cumbersome way so much of the time and it'll be nice to not be stuck in this incredibly cumbersome setup. Like, as fun as it is being surrounded by all these weird computers and cables and things, there's also something to be said for trying to simplify the, the rig. So yeah, Stephen, I think I understand what you're talking about. It is not the cylinder thingy and it is not a Mac Pro, but I was able to get a decently specced out iMac Pro, and that's going to need to hold me for a couple few years. But I think it will. I think it totally will. And I do. Well, we'll find out, won't we? I will report on whether it's able to do VCV rack and stream at the same time, because that's what I will be doing if it can. We'll be finding that out. I'll be testing it out. And if I can do VCV rack streaming, I feel that that is clearly a win because there are so many things that I do in a modular setting that even though I can't plug in plug in I can't program plugins for VCV yet because I can't build the environment that you need in order to program them in. I've got a user who's been porting some of my stuff. I haven't even been able to install their stuff on my machine because the whole thing is kind of a big pile of splat at the moment. But that's me. That's that's my inability to program properly. So, Stephen has been repeatedly raising the idea of a tempo syncopated factor, meaning maybe, I, I'm pretty sure what you're talking about is maybe they're switching from 113 to 130 to 150 without stopping in between. I think that would work. I think you could do that. And that's possible, but I'd have to measure it to be sure. Besides, there are times when, like, Midnight Rambler will be cruising along at this very relaxed pace, and then as they finish it up, they're clearly ramping it up, maybe to the full aggressiveness. Like, as they reach the final end, if you ever catch the Midnight Rambler, they're probably ramping it up to the point where it's as aggressive as it can possibly feel. But you can do stuff like that within the sort of tempo colors of stability and instability. If you know to try, I think it would work. There's even points where it feels like they accelerate into a state of stability and groove, which is depicted by this stuff where if you're in an unstable state and you can accelerate upwards into the swagger zone and then into the, st the stability zone, that is a increase in tempo that's going to feel like you're leveling off at cruising altitude. And if that's the desired result, then, hey, rock on, basically. Especially if you're the Rolling Stones, then rock on. So, swing within a tempo having more effect than a tempo within a range of tempo. Well, swing is often irregularities in the tempo. Tempos don't have to be really rigid. Like the the electronic musician Colin Benders has spent a lot of time, not constantly, sometimes he doesn't incorporate that in his patches, but this guy started doing modular lockdowns and develop, he actually already had a good following, but he developed a massive following and an enormous Discord surfer, which is far more interesting than mine. Um, And one of the things he was working on was what he likes calling wonky clocks, which is you take like a LFO that's doing, you know, like 60 cycles per minute, like one cycle per second, or not even, not even that, subdivide it down to where it's one cycle per quarter note. And then you run it on a clock tempo and you could do this in VCV rack. I would be fooling with that as one of the things I would be demonstrating is like, here, check this out. You can do this with LFOs and things. Frequency modulations of LFOs. 
because you frequency modulate the LFO of the clock by another LFO of a subdivision of it, and that gives you swing. But if you, they're not synchronized, if they're not resyncing on a regular basis, what's going to happen is it'll drift, and then the temp the swings will kind of wander <laughs> and get weird. And if you set the uh, the frequency modulating LFO of your you know clock LFO at very different settings, you can get some really wild wonky things going on. And this is this is well worth fooling with. And it depends, because like Ian, you say, you know, whether it has more effect than a tempo within a range of tempos, it can have just as much of a flavor. It's just how it's being implemented. It's possible to do the wonky clock thing where it really screws up your sense of tempo. It really doesn't come off right. Or, you know, you can call it right and it just comes off as very alien weird stuff. Like I was watching a call in Mender stream once and he was doing the wonky time stuff and just before he got raided by one of the musicians from Lincoln Park on Twitch and they brought a thousand people to his stream, he was doing some completely bonkers wonky time things that were super, super weird. And it was interesting because when you get that weird with swing, when you get really strange things, um, you can chase people away just as much as if you were playing dissonant notes, which I know all about. I've always done lots of dissonant notes, but uh, wonky times can chase people away too. If they expect to be able to groove to something to a steady beat, and then it's going all weird. They mean this is broken, and then they just tune out. But if you do subtle things with the wonky time, then that can because I feel very much like people often consider humanizing time, introducing errors. I don't believe that is the case at all. I don't believe for a second that humanizing time is a matter of just getting the tempo wrong. Instead, the thing about humanizing time is that time, human time or groove is essentially the wonky time. And I've talked repeatedly about how Ringo Starr is a great example of this because Ringo would... Um, play along to the Beatles, and his kick would come in very aggressively. Presumably they would complain if he didn't. But then his snare, partly due to groove and partly due to the fact that he was a small guy and used really heavy sticks in order to be able to play loudly enough for them, um, his snare hand would come through more slowly, so his snare was often quite delayed in some of his best beats it's almost like flamming against the underlying click. And then the kick drum is almost flamming, hitting early when he's really pushing it, when he's really driving it. And it was, but every aspect of that is rock solid. He's moving like a machine. It's just not a machine that is moving in perfect synchrony. Instead, it's moving in such a way that the backbeat you know, hesitates and delays. I've often been doing things with um, my, my timing on my modular rig, which is partly disconnected at the moment, but when I do have it connected, I'm always going to try to stick the uh, snare drum on a somewhat delayed clock. There will be multiple clocks, and some of them will be like a tick early, and some of them will be a tick late and it'll matter a great deal as to which ones I choose. Like, only the kick drum generally gets to come and a, a click early, and I'm often using a duller kick drum. 
I'm often using a kick drum that is pretty slow and laid back and doesn't have a lot of punch on the front of it, but it's hitting early. And then I've got the uh, snare drum and also my bass lines, whether that be other kinds of sounds or I've increasingly been getting into, in fact, I built the thing for myself. I built this for myself and even stuck a picture of it on uh, Instagram. It's my most recent build, which is this little box that just connects these two jacks together. One's a guitar style jack and one's a Euro style jack. And inside, there are two capacitors to ground. One capacitor to ground on this jack and one capacitor to ground on this jack. And then connecting them together is this inductor on the inside. It's a little tiny toroidal inductor. And if this works really well, I can buy lots of those. So that'll be cool. Um, and that inductor is connecting the two together. So basically I have just a little patch cord in here. It just connects the one thing to the other thing. But there's a tone control like in a guitar on the input wire. There's a tone control like in a guitar on the output wire. And then there's an inductor connecting them together, causing it to be a much steeper filter than if you just only had the one to ground. You've, you've now got the capacitor to ground, and then there's also an inductance blocking highs, although it's a really small toroidal inductor. So it uh, will carry a lot of energy, but it's not blocking lots of highs all by itself. It's just contributing to the behavior. And that makes it a two-pole filter. So I used, I have yet to even hear that, but I designed it for use on the bass that I like to use. And I like to use a sine wave generated bass off of one of the chord organs because they work on those all the time. So yeah, I see there, there's folks talking about uh, VCB rack a lot more. So that's cool. I am pleased to hear that's a thing, seeing as I can sort of lean into that and start doing more with it. It's probably not going to replace my actual modular stuff because this has basically been my hobby for ages. I mean, even back in the day, I was building stuff out of parts. And uh, as far as actually making music in a serious way, I like leaning on analog and hardware stuff. Again, one of my intentions is to make ways for people to be able to use that kind of technology, make ways for people to be able to order from me, like uh, eight uh, 4049 hex inverter chips for making guitar stomp boxes or anything else that you could use those chips for, like the... There's this yellow filter thing that I... I don't remember the name of it now, whatever. There is there is a rather famous uh, synthesizer filter that's made using the 4049 hex inverter. And um, I'm working on being able to get stuff like that into people's hands, although it's going to be somewhat cumbersome and I don't know whether it's actually going to work or not. So I kind of have to avoid getting too loaded up with a million billion parts in the belief that people are going to buy them since I can make them available at a more affordable price than usual. Um, I don't know whether that's necessarily going to be a thing. Andy is um, asking, will there be any music stream this week? I really don't know. As you can see, stuff is in pieces. It's totally in pieces. And I got a lot of work to do on the uh, getting the new computer together. I really don't know. I think it might be no more music for the foreseeable future until stuff gets together. Uh, I have a lot of work to do. Things are just not ready. 
I keep working more and more on getting things more and more ready, but there's so much to do. I got my little note cards for um, new ways of getting stuff together. For instance, I think I should be able to get stuff so that I can have my electric piano and guitar both go into the uh, mix together, and that's not currently the case. Yeah, I'm I'm working on getting all these things together, and a lot of it has to do with that modular stuff that things are based off of, and that is very much under construction right now, like. Right now, since this morning, when I started reconfiguring it again, it's not even in playable condition. And I don't know if that's going to be any better this week. All I know is I'm working on getting it better so when it does come back to life, it's worth paying attention to, because that's been the problem. The problem has been that I've been able to do this stuff. I've been able to show up like two times a week for close to two hours each time, and it hasn't been worth anybody hearing, so why am I even doing it? So I'm rebuilding it all. I think that's something that many people run into, especially in this day and age. Like, you can never tell. Those those Generation Z kids that have been watching constantly, that are listening to, like, 70s rock and progressive war horses, and it's so delightful to watch them discover they, they claim that they're hearing it for the first time I really don't know whether that is true I feel like that could be just part of the story but I'm not too worried about it and it there's elements of it that could be true but um, how do you know when you have that on your hands and when you're just wasting your damn time spending a lot of effort doing something that nobody will ever care about? That is a big question. And I've never been able to come up with a particularly good answer for that. Like, I think those kids are kicking my ass in Patreon, and I have been doing this line of work that I do for, what, like 30 years? And, and yet some kids in college in Florida are making a bunch of money because it's fun to watch them listen to stuff for the first time and enjoy music and they're capable of understanding it and they're very enthusiastic and it's like yeah i'm watching them too so what does that tell you so yeah it many many big questions and I, I like the fact that I can keep putting out plugins, and there's a bunch of people who really appreciate that. That is that is super cool. And not to not to to whine too badly about people who are being superstars at Patreon, because that's partly like just before making this video, I watched them doing a video reacting to Eddie Van Halen playing live, and very insightful. But one of the things about that is Eddie playing live back in the 80s, it's very much a showman thing. There's not a lot of musical content there. There's some. It goes to some interesting places, but it's this little taste of like, okay, a little taste of classical, a little wah, 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 wah with the whammy bar, squeals and shrieky noises that blast the arena with sound. And he's like, draw, and then just sort of waits for the applause he's like a circus performer the the rock and roll arena of the 1980s was basically a circus ring and it's interesting and i love the fact that these kids got that immediately they were like he was being a showman there's some music in here but it's not really about being music in here but he was being a showman and then they also watched a, a dream theater and i don't like to rep on dream theater but they watched a dream theater video and had a few criticisms on the basis of the the people in Dream Theater were not playing with wild abandon. They were playing this really detailed stuff, which they totally were. It was super difficult. 
not pushing beyond, like it was all coming out very neatly orchestrated as Dream Theater likes to do. This is a Mike Magini era. And the there's a big difference between the Wild Abandon and they were kind of like, it feels like this music is constructed to be patterns of notes and scales and things like that. They're working, they're focusing very hard on that, but I'm not feeling a human quality. And that's a very legitimate criticism of that stuff, or observation more than criticism, because it's not necessarily a bad thing. You can want to listen to stuff like that. A, comp a counterpart would be if you listen to Bach etudes or something. And... Uh, then there is also the purpose of making the human connection with people. You know, those the kids were also listening to Van Halen, uh, the Fair Warning album, and uh, which is great, and enjoyed uh, David Lee Roth singing enormously on stuff like Unchained for exactly the right reasons. It's not that he's a good singer, but he's really just dumping the charisma out there. And it's very interesting. It's cool to see people reacting to this kind of stuff and worth paying attention to for anybody who is doing creative things to be shared with others. Because it's always this complicated balance um, where you want to play for an audience but maybe you also have an agenda, like there's stuff that you want to accomplish, kinds of things that you want to do. Like Brian Eno went in a direction of doing ambient music that was very passive, very submissive, and you're meant to not be explicitly listening to it. Much, It's like the opposite of the Van Halen in an arena in the 1980s being showman being a circus act, basically. The opposite of that is Brian Eno ambient music, where you're not supposed to pay attention to the music or the musician at all. And I've always had a tendency of wanting to design music that could essentially do stuff for me. Like the David Lee Roth thing does not fit me very well. And it's always been a real challenge finding out like where I stand with all that kind of stuff. And that's uh, something, even if you're doing like EDM bangers and very compositionally, very producing. Um, I can't tell you the name of the React Guys channel, but one of their names is Andy and they are College Students React. So I would say do a YouTube search for... Andy College students react and you'll get a pile of videos from these guys because they're incredibly prolific. They do a lot of videos and and quite rightly too. You can you can post it into my chat if you find the name of this, the channel. Like I've literally got the name of the channel but I'm busy streaming so I am less likely to dig it up and uh, start the real problem is if I go to their, I, I have their videos page dragged onto my desktop because I'm just going to go and keep watching more of their stuff. And if I go to that, I'll start watching their videos. <laughs> and they can't, that's not something I can do right now. So let's not. Um, but yeah, it is, it's interesting to be connected with that enthusiasm. Like again, one of the things that, that got me connected to these guys in the first place was there was a video that they did, College Students React, and it started out with just Andy, and then there's another, the other fellow, I don't know them well enough, they don't really say their names or anything like that, although they should, it, their videos keep showing their logo, so I should, I should really get it, I'm being dumb and burnt out, and that's just fine, that's just how it's going to be. I have to go through burnt out phases in order to get to phases where I'm doing a lot of creative work. But um, they did the video of listening to Close to the Edge for the first time. And, uh, and it was extremely beautiful because they didn't know that much about 
yes, they'd listened to, I think, a couple of things, but this is, of course, Yes's greatest moment. And the beginning of that sidelong track is really demanding. Like, there's a lot going on harmonically. There's a lot going on rhythmically. They'll be doing this crazy stuff, and then... All this stuff going on. And these kids are basically, you know, prog rock heads waiting to happen. They liked all of the, you know, they liked some Primus. They liked themselves some Tool. They liked some Dream Theories. That's the one. Andy and Alex, College Students Reacts. I like those guys. I like those guys a lot. They have no idea who I am. I'm way too old for them. They're, they're Gen Z. I'm Gen X. But um, they're enthusiastic. Like, they're me. They're younger me. And their enthusiasm is super contagious. And it's definitely what I need right now that I'm taking apart my system and, like, stopping music for a month is uh, to be reconnected to that enthusiasm. And, again, the close to the edge thing their observations are really cogent. I mean, they might be college students, but, you know, they don't simply react. They are analyzing. Their observations about stuff, I think, are pretty damn spot on. You know, I'm liking that aspect of it. There was also another fellow where um, he also did a uh, listens too close to the edge for the first time and reacts. And his observations weren't nearly as cogent. Like, Andy and Alex are good at analyzing what they have just heard, as well as being enthusiastic at reacting. The other fellow was not as cogent as far as talking about what he had ob observed, but it was also beautiful to watch him silently listen to all of Close to the Edge, because it's always fun listening to Close to the Edge. But then as they got to the final bit... And, you know, it's now that it's all over and done, down to the sea, down to the sun, now that you're fine, now that your whole seasons will pass you by. I get up, I get down. That, the, the other fellow who watched it, he was like on the verge of tears at the final moments as it went into that last bit that he'd never heard before. He was like on the verge of tears as it brought him to that that peak. It and then the the ambient noise comes back in, and he starts settling down, like wreathed in smiles. And then as he started talking, he basically got himself back together again, and was arguably too cool to be on the verge of tears or anything. But there was that moment. There was that moment when the music hit him and took him to that particular point and wow like Andy and Alex didn't really get hit that hard by it emotionally but they were lit up like Christmas trees on the stuff it was amazing they, they talk about being lost in the sauce partly because much like many college students they're like oh yeah we're really freaky and they're Pink Floyd stoners or whatever most likely and like Andy started off the entire channel by listening to Piper at the Gates of Dawn by Pink Floyd for the first time ever. So, yeah, no, the, the, the King Crimson video is on their Patreon because that's one of the videos that YouTube will not allow them to post. There's apparently a bunch of stuff, and I ran into this immediately because the first thing I tried to do was Beatles. <laughs> it's an act of complete arrogance and willfulness even to attempt it but I, I thought I was going to start a uh, the Evergreens thing on YouTube with Beatles I didn't even finish the stream before they had me black but um, their, their King Crimson 21st Century Schizoid Man is on their Patreon behind their paywall I believe and there's also stuff that they've got on uh, on their Patreon They've also got some stuff that's been rehosted on Vimeo because it wasn't intended to be paywall only, but it also got kicked off of YouTube, so they rehosted it on Vimeo. And I watched some of that stuff, too. It was very interesting. 
Uh, Andy, uh, Chris listening to your songs for the first time video it would be bonkers. I think I'm not nearly as good at that kind of stuff as these kids. Like, uh, what you would get with me is I would be able to analyze very well, I think. But also, if it was working well, you'd have my eyes jittering like they sometimes do, or I'd be blinking super fast, because that's what happens to me. If I'm listening to music and there's a lot going on, especially if it's high-frequency information, and there's a lot going on, um, blinking is said to be like mental cuts in the movie scene. Walter Murch, a noted editor, I think it's Walter Murch, um, did a book on film editing. And in doing this book, he was analyzing how you make cuts. Why do cuts seem natural in film? since there's nothing natural about it. You're showing film up to one point, then you're showing a completely different film. Why do we why do we consider that to be natural? Why is that in any way plausible? Why don't we just get frustrated and be like, ugh, it keeps showing different movies at me, and yet we register it instantly? Well, if you look at something and then look at something else, your eye will instinctively blink as you change position of your eye direction. Like you look at this and then you look at that. If it's enough of a shift, it's very likely that your eye will blink, especially if you're not thinking about it, as you move your focus to the new thing that you're looking at. And then your eye opens, pointed at the new thing, and you feel as if it is a continuous arc of looking, but in fact, there's been an interruption. Your eyelids have come down, cut off your vision, and then come back up again. And the thing about it is, the thing about it is I don't remember the damn thing I was talking about. I'm sorry, I'm very burnt out at the moment. It's been a lot going on. It's, that will keep happening from time to time. At least I can keep putting out plugins, right, guys? Dutty has a question. Love your plugins so far. Can I make a decent master with just Air Windows plugins? And if yes, which ones would suffice? I should think so, yeah. If you have a truly great mix, um, purest gain would suffice. People don't understand what mastering is. The idea of mastering is getting a second person to hear and evaluate your mixing and audio and adjust it in such a way that it will communicate to an audience. Mastering is not a make stuff louderator or make stuff brighterator or something like that. It is a very specific concept that is increasingly ignored and And that doesn't matter. So you need to rephrase your question. If you're asking, how can I make stuff just super loud? That's not necessarily a good question because these days you don't necessarily want to. Like if you go for a super loud CD style master, it's just going to get turned down on YouTube and stuff anyway. And if you're doing, I think the most coherent observation is if you're doing a master on the same speakers in the same room in the same environment that you did the mix on, you're completely wasting your time. That said, I can give you an answer. The one Air Windows plugin you want for this is monitoring. And by that I mean Monitoring is capable of taking your environment, even if it's the same thing that you mixed on, and putting it in a such wildly different context that you're forced to reevaluate. If you take the, the master that you've got, you're playing it, and you're like, this is what's supposed to go out to the world, and you're in monitoring, 
and you switch monitoring to subs only, all of a sudden you're hearing nothing but this just earthquake sound. And it might be fairly distorted depending upon if you've got stuff too loud, but it should be coming across at about the same volume or maybe a bit louder. And you should be able to still sort of get a sense of what the music is like if you're only hearing like bass and you have no kick or anything in there or if you're only hearing kick and everything else is just completely gone away that might be an indication that you want to change something same for slew only slew only you'll hear nothing but the highs you'll hear nothing but brightness and if it's like oh there's nothing but symbols here or why are my guitars five times louder than I thought that they should be? That tells you something. By the same token, if you put on uh, peaks only, that's going to give you a really strange, unusual sound, but it's a sound where uh, if there's stuff that is excessively loud, it's poking out of the mix, but you didn't really think about it very much because it sounded right at the time, it's going to exaggerate that really aggressively. So, what you do is you get monitoring. No, don't pay attention to this argument about doing multiple dithers because that's the least important thing you could be doing. Dither is very interesting, but it is not, and it, it's even a mastering style thing, but it's not necessarily, like, there's a reason that I'm trying to work out whether dark or not just another dither belongs in the monitoring plugin because this should not be something down to the person that's mixing necessarily. You could, but um, it's like choosing what mixing board you've got. Choosing a dither is like choosing what mixing board you've got. In theory, you could be doing that on the basis of, I generally want to create this kind of thing, but it's not a particularly useful creative decision to be primarily thinking about while doing your work. So get monitoring, the monitoring plugin, and experiment with the stuff near the top where it's these different monitoring things, and listen to what it does with like peaks only, subs only, slew only. You're listening much like if you were taking it to a mastering studio and listening through different speakers in a different environment, you're listening to the audio that's being wildly altered and changed in such a way that there's useful information that can come out of that. And you can compensate for stuff that you learn. And this is nothing new. People have always done things like this. You can listen to your mix and go in the other room and lie down in your back on the floor and hear what that sounds like regarding you know, if your mix feels weird when you're in another room in the house lying on your back on the floor, then maybe that's telling you like, okay, the bass is too heavy over here. If I go back to the normal position and I adjust for that, maybe I can make it so that no matter where I go or what I do, it's still gonna basically work. And that's more like mastering than like experimenting with different other plugins or whatever. That's more of a sideshow. It's more of a gear designer thing, honestly, which is why I built it into monitoring. Monitoring always runs through my current best uh, word length reducer. At the like, this was not just another dither for a long time, and the idea there is. This should, should not be a, like, let me pick the best 24-bit dither for this particular song. No, you really shouldn't be doing anything like that. Because there should be one that basically does things correctly and lets you focus on stuff that's going to be more obvious. And that's very possibly dark going forwards, but it's been not just another dither for some time. And uh, we'll see how this continues to develop. But... Um, yeah. Did I answer the question, seeing as it's now like a little past 12.30? We got about 10, 12 minutes or so to go before I'm done with my stream for the day. Um, did I answer your question as far as what plugins for mastering? 
because I think that the the stuff in monitoring is going to be the best answer because I'm defining mastering the way mastering needs to be defined. And Andy, I'll tell you, as far as what plugins are coming out next, I've got a lot of these dither revisits, a lot of this like dithers with the 24 16 bit switch and DRES built into them. Which means that not only do I need to finish doing the not just another dither and having that replace the one that's currently there, but defaulting to like if you put the new one in and then loaded up old stuff, it would do exactly what it did before. I fervently hope anyway. But um, like you could you can run it as the 24 bit without touching anything, but you can also open it up and do the uh, DRES type stuff. And the uh, remaining stuff is, for instance, things like, have you ever heard what not, what uh, Dither Me Timbers or Studio Tan sound like in a bit crusher? Because those are not as refined. They're not the final thing, not like... Uh, Dark really managed to nail it, but I've never had those as part of a bit crusher before. I think it might be a kind of a good idea. I think it might be kind of nice. People might find that if they were building sort of their virtual, you know, they're building a virtual Akai, like they're building a virtual MPC, so they want to work within the box, but they also want it to sound like these vibey old machines, and they want to do a certain amount of bit crush in order to do that, but Rather than use like Logit's cheesy bit crush or whatever, you're using an Air Windows one with a continuous control on the amount of crush that you get to have. And it's also running Dither Me Timbers or the Studio Tan. And applying that as well as applying the bit crush, and then you maybe dial it back until it's subtle, or maybe you make it super obvious. But it seems to, you know, that's going to be more and more obvious the coarser the bit crushing gets. So it might get to where it's really making a striking tonal co contribution to it. And I have a bunch of, like, my TPDF needs to be in this. Uh, Paul Dither needs to be in this. Tape Dither needs to be in this. And that's the thing is I've got a bunch of those to put out. So I think I'm going to be progressively putting those things out. As far as guitar bass related plugins, that continues to be something that is sort of in long range planning. I have every intention of doing those, but I don't feel that anything that I do is going to be nearly as good as getting a real amp and using that. I really just like I don't buy D I don't buy in the box guitars and basses. I just don't. I will run I will run a DIY uh, a DI uh, bass in conjunction with an amp. I'm also working on some of that stuff. Like I need to, I'm working on getting a better microphone for my guitar rig and I'm waiting on that. That's also gonna be this week, I think. But when I have got that, I'm going to have to take this entire thing apart, basically pick up the electric piano and put it somewhere else. That's gonna be joyous. Hopefully I don't break my neck doing that. Take apart the ISO box put in a condenser mic into the ISO box rather than the 57 because I'm doing the William Whitman thing of basically hitting on 57s and using better quality mics for everything and the same kind of mic and the same mic for everything. I'm increasingly uh, buying into that kind of thing. And when I have the guitar thing set up with the condenser mic in such a way that it sounds good and right, it, it'll make my guitar sound less like, oh yeah, modern metal 57, SM57 rip, and my guitars will st start sounding more like Beatles, where they did mic stuff with uh, fancier mics because they were, you know, EMI, and they were micing things with the proper mics for stuff. So... 
my stuff will be leaning more in that direction, more Beatles-y, less 80s. And when I've got the guitar set up to do that, which is going to be a pile of work that way, I also need to take the bass. I'm not sure you can see that. You can kind of see the bass. I need to do a sample set of that rig bass with my DI slash guitar amp setup with the roto sounds that I've got on it because I'm about to replace them. And since I'm about to replace like clangy round wounds on a Rickenbacker, what I always thought I was going to be using with uh, Labella tape wounds on the advice of William Whitman again, because honestly, I've played Labella tape wounds on my old Hofner I used to have, and there was something very special about that. And the cheap-ass Mustang bass that I've got sitting over there also runs tape wounds. And I just have an intuitive feeling that I can do the Chris, Chris Squire bass miking rig, which is two pickups, two inputs. It could be two different amps, but otherwise neck pickup goes DI and the bridge pickup goes to an amp that's like a, a guitar amp. I've got that. I used that on the, the track that I did. I feel as if I was maybe lacking a little bit simply because... I didn't have the roto sounds yet, but I was also doing a kind of clangy tone, and I'm not sure that's really where my bass stuff resides. So I need to do a set of uh, samples so people can have a sample instrument of a Rickenbacker bass mic'd up and set up this way, because I'm not sure that exists. I'm not sure anybody has. Let's, let's call it a... Um, Rickenbacker bass sound where the, there is a DI on the bass pickup and then the bridge pickup, the clangy stuff, is going into a guitar amp that is slightly distorted or just, you know, turned up all the way and then recorded down to, say, a stereo track so that you have your stereo mix on the sampled instrument, but then you get to run it through something like Golem and adjust the positioning uh, relative to each other, re adjust the balance, get them down to a mono. You'd basically be running those into Golem. And I don't think anybody's done that. I think that it should happen. I think you should be able to have a, a sampler instrument, like an ASX24 instrument. We will see whether the modern logic sampler produces stuff that other people can use or whether it produces stuff that's like logic only or some bullshit like that because I think it is possible that they do. Oh, and now we have a sweary stream. Oh, well. Um, but um, hopefully not. But I need to do these recordings so that people can have those so that people can download four free sampler instruments including like a progressive rock bass that is really what you would get and want. I can even play it using like my fingernail as downstrokes like it was a pick, um, which is my way of doing that kind of pick style thing. But I can do that in such with such forcefulness that it'll come off like a Chris Squire bass line because I have observed enough of his stuff to know how he basically played and did things. And though I could not play like Chris Squire, I can sound the string in such a way that it will come off like that and be part of your sampler instrument and then you can program it and there'll be a Rick bass in there doing the thing that you need. So, and I need to do that before I put on the flat ones because the question about, um, the question about are tape wounds more like flat wounds or half rounds? Tape wounds are flat wounds, but then they also have a layer of, not like electrical tape, electrical tape is softer, but there is this black plastic on top of them, which makes them very like comfortable to play and, and smooth and stuff. And it keeps anything from getting inside the string, which is also good. But they just have this wonderful sort of 
upright bass quality. They, they, they resonate more than you would think. It's not like they're covered with goo. It's not like they're covered with tar. But um, the thing about tape wounds is that they're kind of like ultimate flat wounds. They're, they're pretty key. Like people who are super into flat wounds, I think will often favor Labella tape wounds. Labella is the company that makes them. In fact, I can take a moment, seeing as we're still talking in the, in the last few minutes. This is what to get. This, as William Whitman suggests, but also I too suggest it because I had some of these uh, short scale. Because if you have a Hofner, you have to get short scale. But if you have a Hofner base and you put these on, it's unreal. Unreal. Just bonkers how good for that type of thing. They don't look like this, by the way. They're not red, but they're they're black. But black nylon tape wound. Uh, William suggested the light gauge, which I agree with because I like playing light gauge on bases as well. And that is how that works. So let me scan over a chat while we're winding to a close here. Uh, so I have much to do today. I'm going to be very distracted for the next week, but that's fine. We'll get through all of this, and I'll have cool new stuff, and I'll be able to do cool new stuff like VCB backstreaming and such. Yeah. Shadow V observes I would start mastering by using a lot of different pairs of speakers. Nice. You got a clue. That's a clue. That's much more relevant than what plugin you use. Uh, which is not to say that it's necessarily the most useful because it depends upon what speakers you choose and stuff. But yeah, yeah, that's going to get you farther than picking different uh, compressors. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Oh, I remember I was talking about blinking because when I, when I got on that rant about blinking and the the film editing... Basically, what I was saying was, if you see, and you've seen this on videos of mine before, if I'm listening to something, like lis listening and reacting to people's mixes and such, which I think might be an odd choice, but um, if I am fixedly listening and then I start blinking insanely fast, it means that many thoughts are bouncing around my head. And sometimes when thoughts do that and they are striking enough, they trigger a blink. So I'll do this like crazed blinking at times when I'm critically listening to audio. And I noticed that Alex and Andy kids doing a little bit of that too. Um, but uh, that is evidence that you have triggered enough thoughts with me quickly enough that I'm reacting on a visceral level rather than just sort of disinterestedly thinking about stuff. Like if I'm listening to your music and it's like blankety, 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 that means you're doing something interesting in there. And it really got my ear. It really got my attention. And it is it is subconscious. I'm, I cannot intentionally blink as fast as that. Instead, it just triggers. It just kind of happens. Uh, Darwin, if your mix didn't use console, you should probably mix using console or remix using console because if you add it to something, it will just change the balances of things, possibly to an undesirable effect. So mixing through console is pretty critical. I do have hopes of bringing out some new console stuff, which is not necessarily going to be right away. The experiments I was doing with the... Um, the Lavery capture modes, like the transformer and tube and, and stuff that's built into the Lavery, I dropped that because the one that I chose, the the um, transformer mode, also was developing a sort of low crackling noise in the background of my sound, and that was coming off of the actual converter. I don't know whether that's part of the algorithm or whether it was highlighting something that I need to get looked at in the Lavery. I'm not really sure. I do know that when I switched away from it, the slight crackliness in the bottom of the mix 
basically just went away. So I was like, okay, not using that. But it did remind me that the tube thing was compressing in one direction and like expanding in the other. And there are ways I could do that in a console system where you could take a channel and offset it slightly. And by that, what I mean is if you take a channel and offset it slightly, you'd have a control. It would be a console system. It would probably be console 5 system, not so much console 6. But you would be able to take the channel and code and manipulate it in the way similar to what the tube of um, the Lavery thing was doing. You would get more second harmonic distortion. And this is also the case for like a microphone I'm looking to get, a, a big old microphone upgrade that could be quite exciting. But that does the second harmonic gen generation using FETs. And the thing about the possible console upgrade is there would be an additional control that would be essentially offsetting much like the single-ended triode plugin does. But if it's in a console system, that means you would be having the console behavior, but you could dial in a little bit of second harmonic, like second harmonic warmth or whatever, and a little bit of amplitude expansion on the other side of the second harmonic. And that, because it's part of the console system, that seems really interesting to me. That seems like that could come in real handy. And I had not thought of doing it before, so it might be worth a try. We shall see. So Doty or Duty, the SP1200, I tried to get there once. I tried to make a 1200 plugin once. I called it Bit Glitter or ESP, and didn't really succeed at doing that. But it was the basis of some of my plugins like DRES. And I don't know, I can see whether maybe it's possible that some of the ones I'll be coming out with in upcoming weeks will be what you need for getting there. Like, for instance, if it turns out that using the DRES function inside uh, Studio Tan, for instance, is the style. Or indeed, you know, you've already got access to uh, Dark. So if you use DRES inside Air Windows Dark, does that get you there? Or is it not really the same? And once I've got the my ducks in a row and I've got this stuff built, you can also try it with uh, Studio Tan or uh, Dither Me Timbers. And those are also... Uh, alternate ways of doing word length reduction slash bit crushing. So basically I would say try that. I'm never going to do a thing that is like, oh, this has this SP1200 faceplate, but I'm often doing things where it's like, well, what if bit crushing sounded cooler and more interesting? And I've also, I think I've got bit glitter out again, or something like it. I seem to remember that was not so long ago even. But I do have bit crushy type things. I would experiment with those things and look for them. So yeah. So Percy, think about joining the VCV forum. Oh, sounds nice. Maybe I should. Because I would be needing help getting the dev environment set up. I have failed repeatedly to do it. I mean, there's lots of things that I could do. And the guy that ported some of my stuff over had working examples of things. And the thing about it is if I can get the dev environment set up and stable and working where it's not going to be changed out from under me or whatever, and I can build one plugin, I can build them all. I just haven't gotten to being able to build one plugin yet, and it'll take me a bunch of time to build them all. But that that's basically how that works. And one last question, one last answer, seeing as it's um, over time, it's like past my business, not, I'm not using bedtime, but uh, when was NJAD changed and what exactly changed and what remains to be changed? Well, the thing about it is that not just another dither got debugged 
over the course of some time. Early versions had a bug in where there was a um, algorithm controlling code where values would get larger and then you would cut them back. But the the code for checking whether you should cut them back had a bug in it where it was like if something equals zero, which is always true or always false or wh whatever it was, it did this thing where it didn't do what it was supposed to do. And so there was a bug and it still functioned, but it caused it to sound different. And then when I re-examined it, I found, oh, hey, this is a bug. I can re-implement this in a different way. And it was doing the same thing, but better. So I felt that I had upgraded the sound of it, and that's the current version. And what remains to be changed? Not much. What remains is I need to put it into the original uh, plugin so that it has the 2416-bit switch and the DRES control so that people can explore it a little bit more. And that could end up being like the SB1200 styly thing. That and maybe some simple filtering or something. And lastly, um, Shadow, why do so many professionally recorded rock or metal band mixes sound like they're being played through an AM radio? Uh, I'm not really sure. I'd have to... That would have to be more of a Chris Reacts, like show me stuff that I can play on YouTube and I will tell you what's going on with that. That could conceivably happen. I know that the Wings of Pegasus guy was getting that to happen on a consistent basis. I think if you refer to things that are already on YouTube, you're less likely to get thwacked off of the channel and have copyright strikes thrown at you because otherwise the other person would have gotten copyright struck too. But uh, as far as, I don't know what being played through an AM radio sounds like, but I will tell you one thing, is that if you like really extended range and what you're hearing is just a, abrasively mid-rangey stuff, that makes things louder. If you have stuff that's all honking mid-rangey and stuff, that is the most effective way to have maximum perceived loudness at a particular output amplitude. And... So that could be being done on purpose and it could be getting done just to make, you know, make all the guitars and things seem louder. And that is uh, a choice. It would be a combination of all the compression and all the mastering technique and all the EQ to the result of making things sound as loud as possible at any given moment. Alrighty, so I think that will do for now. It's been real. It's been a thing. I hope to continue to have better camera and computer and all of the above. And I'm looking forward to getting that stuff. I can, I can make some of this easier on myself, I feel, as far as being able to work with it. Like right now, I have a camera position all weird and goofy because it's sitting in front of my screen because the screen's wider than the resulting screen will be and stuff, and it's all kind of ridiculous. Working on it. So, on that note, it has been my Q&A, and anybody who wants to catch up with me on Wednesday and might have the new compi able to play Minecraft and stream on Wednesday, that's probably the first thing I'll try. And so you can catch up with me there and ask me how that went. And I'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.